Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Chartworks CEO Ross Clark will run down the action on the markets over the past week. Publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report, Mark Faber, comments on where he feels the Dow is headed and how hard it will be to make money as the markets slow down. He also talks about where precious metals are headed. Wolf Street's Wolf Richter talks about the auto and real estate markets. He says some subprime lenders in the auto field have already failed. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have company showcase updates from American Manganese President Larry Ray and Arctic Star CEO Scott Eldridge. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Cypress Development Corp.'s flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Glance Technologies owns and operates Glance Pay, a disruptive mobile payment technology now live in 16 cities in Canada and about to launch in the U.S. With revenues up 664% in the last quarter, Glance Technologies has the potential to be a worldwide leader in an industry projected to grow to $1.3 trillion in three years. Glance Technologies stock symbols are GLNFF in the U.S. and GET in Canada. Find out more at glancepay.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Chartwork CEO Ross Clark. Welcome back to the show, Ross. Always good to be with you, Jim. Ross, interest rates, are they still climbing? No, they are not. They are just sitting right here. We're sitting at about a 311 on the U.S. Uh, long bond. Uh, that's the uh, anything up to 30 years, sitting at 297 on the 10-year but stable up here. Um, but the fact is that the yield curve is continuing to flatten. Uh, that's the difference between short-term rates and long-term rates. And so with that, a, then still a positive underlying bias for the equity market. And, um, you know, we've seen that triangle consolidation that was happening in the various indices with the Dow being the weakest, retesting the, mul the lows multiple times and the Russell 2000, the small caps, and the tech stocks being the best, um, that pattern is resolving to the upside. We're breaking out through good resistance lines. Uh, the the uh, Russell 2000 at this point is testing its all-time highs, so um, definitely uh, seeing you know good equity markets and uh, no no concerns as i say from over on the um, the financial side of it as far as the uh, the bond market is concerned as a matter of fact even the uh, the emerging market bonds the emb which gave a great sell signal earlier this year uh, has had two big waves of selling, and we got major capitulation signals uh, the early part of the week. We're starting to see a good bounce over there. So even the weakest of sectors now starting to show um, enough buoyancy that I think you can see better life uh, for everything. Now, we always talk about seasonals and the potentials for the top. So May and July are the two windows we want to be looking at here. So the rally that has now taken us up nicely off the lows, we're up about 100 points on the, the S&P now um, off the most recent low. Uh, don't want to see this give back too much. We had recommended uh, raising the stops recently just to uh, the levels of two weeks ago. And I think at this point now, you might want to even tighten them up a little bit more. How is the U.S. dollar doing? U.S. dollar, a uh, great rally into a week ago, and um, we got uh, some overbought radians actually on our signals. We got upside exhaustions uh, three days in a row. We got a sequential nine, which meant you had nine consecutive days closing above four days earlier. Those type of things tend to occur a few days before interim highs, and in the case of the euro, we saw just the reciprocal of that. We saw the uh, sequential nine near the lows. We got capitulation of a minor degree. So you're seeing a bit of a pullback as far as the currencies are concerned. 
Ross, what's happening in the precious metals market? Well, the precious metals, uh, we've seen just a, a really nice bounce off a good oversold level as far as gold and silver were concerned. And what's really important here to look at is that the, when gold and silver sold off at the early part of this month, they just uh, gold just marginally took out the March low by literally a couple of dollars. But this was at the same time that the U.S. dollar itself was just screaming through its March highs and right back up to levels that we had seen uh, in the latter part of uh, 2017. So with all that strength in the dollar, you'd expect that gold on a relative basis would have been trading down in the 1260 to 1270 range, but it has held exceptionally well. And this is, uh, and, and we've also seen at the same time point that the mining stocks, the GDX, if you look at the GDXJ, which are the two ETFs for the seniors and the juniors, they held well, well above the March lows. And so that positive divergence that's in there is something we've seen around a lot of important lows as far as the gold market is concerned. So the big picture is such that we think that this is in the methodical early stages of a bull market. I don't think it's ready to race away on the upside until you maybe get into the second half of the year. But for now, it's a very constructive looking pattern. Uh, we'll pro we closing off the week in the uh, 1320 range. There's resistance probably in the 1330 to 1345 area. I think it's going to have a lot of trouble getting through there initially. Uh, maybe a lot bit more backing and filling like we've been having for the better part of this year. So, you know, you can buy the good hard breaks and sell it into the resistance levels. And for the longer term investors, because of what we're seeing in the miners, uh, and we're seeing gold break out in terms of other currencies like the euro, I think that for the buy and hold investor, it's uh, reasonable to look at buying any of the dips these days. The crude oil market, was is this a surprise? Um, the, the movement through the $70 range holding up into the 71 to 72, uh, we're seeing good overbought readings in here. The type of things that we look back at it, we find that, uh, and we won't get into the specifics of it, but the bottom line is that May should end up perf uh, producing an interim high. And we'll be looking for, and uh, price wise, I don't know what that's going to be, whether it's 72 or 75 or some other number, but once we've got May behind us, we've developed far enough in this move that we would expect to see a 50% correction of the rally from the lows that we put in earlier this year down at the, uh, the $58 level. So look for that 50% retracement. Uh, I've got some other parameters. If people are subscribing, they'll know what they are. As those parameters come into play, we'll be looking for a second leg to the upside, but a correction, I believe, is is in the offing for the month of June. Ross, with crude rising in price, why isn't the Canadian dollar doing better? Uh, amazingly, uh, you know, you'd expect to see us uh, performing better. The interest rate differential, it, normally we'd look at that and say, well, is, is this not uh, going to attract money uh, into uh, you know as, as the spread would be theoretically um, improving uh, with Canadian interest rates to U.S. But we are not able to raise rates very much these days. The U.S. has had a significant rise in rates. The Canadian market has had a nominal one, and you know there just isn't any reason for the big money to come pouring in here. We had a bit of a bounce of the dollar during the week, but really, if we look at the overall trend of the last few months, um, we just don't seem to be attracting enough foreign capital. And um, you know, whether that's for political reasons uh, that uh, people are unhappy with what they're seeing uh, from some of the decisions out of Ottawa or out of provinces such as BC and Alberta, uh, the big money is uh, at this point uh, looking for other places to uh, to find a home. Ross, thank you so much. Good to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Chartworks.ca CEO Ross Clark. Coming up, Mark Faber, the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom report that you can find at gloomboomdoom.com. 
Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp. Inc., MGI on the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected high-grade gold, including 16.9 meters of 13.58 grams and 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program is planned to further evaluate previously identified subsurface high-grade gold mineralization. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology, replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Mark Faber, editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom report at GloomBoomDoom.com. He's speaking to us from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Mark, welcome back to This Week in Money. Well, thank you very much for having me on your program. Are people nervous in Thailand, wondering what's going to happen between the two Koreas? Actually, uh... In my opinion, not at all. Uh, it's not a subject that is widely discussed. And I think that the U.S. press makes a bigger deal out of it than, say, Asians. Well, the thing is that, uh, in general, if the two Koreas uh, have lifted their war status, and have concluded a peace agreement, I think in general, this is perceived as very positive. We keep hearing two very divergent points of view on the Dow. Some people say it's going to collapse, others say it's going to 40,000. What do you see ahead for the Dow and the S&P 500? Well, I wish I knew precisely. You know, one of the problems of markets nowadays is that uh, they are... A lot of sophisticated investors, experts, portfolio managers that are very thorough in their research, technicians that are essentially to some extent uh, very thorough in their own research, technically and so forth. And there are so many different points of view about the U.S. dollar, about interest rates in the U.S about the stock market and so forth and so on, that actually nobody really knows. And my view is that the big bull market we had in asset prices between 1982 and just recently is basically over. From here onwards, returns will be dismal. Doesn't mean that everything collapses, but I don't think that investors will make a lot of money. Now, uh, as you know, in a lottery, there is always one winner, and if he's very lucky, he may win the lottery in uh, two s uh, subsequent years. And so then he can write the book, How I Won the Lottery. And so with the market, it's the same. Some fund manager, he may write the book and say, How I, I outperformed the market for 20 years. In the very long run, 20 years is not that much. But the point is, it's difficult for investors from here on to make money in bonds, stocks, commodities, real estate, and so forth. I think we're in a period of disappointing asset price returns. And in my view, and this is overlooked by most investors or economists, I think if asset prices decline... In other words, if we have an asset deflation, it will be very negative for the global economy. Do you think the Dow will outperform the Asian and European markets? Well, after 2016, the emerging markets bottomed out and outperformed the U.S. market. Say last year, the emerging markets and the European markets significantly outperformed the U.S. market. 
partly also because of the U.S. dollar weakness. So you had European and Asian markets going up by something like 25 to 35 percent. Vietnam went up by 55 percent in dollar terms, whereas the U.S. S&P was up 19 percent, which is also a fabulous performance. It's not as good as Europe was or the Asian markets was. And now I think we're in a period for a few months where due to the rising U.S. interest rate and uh, also the strengthening of the dollar as a result of these rising interest rates, I think we're in a period when the U.S. may outperform for a few months the Asian market. But I think in general... Uh, I view the strength of the U.S. dollar not as a permanent feature, but as a temporary feature, and that at some point you will have to move again out of U.S. dollars. But for now, I think the U.S. dollar may keep on going up somewhat. Speculators are positioned uh, on the short side of the U.S. dollar. They'll probably have to cover these positions, and then the dollar rallies another maybe 5%. And then it will be time to probably abandon the U.S. dollar. What do you think might replace the U.S. dollar as the hot currency? Well, again, experts have all different opinions. Some people think that maybe bitcoins will outperform the U.S. dollars or cryptocurrencies and so forth. I rather think that uh, what will replace the U.S. dollar and all currencies are precious metals. This would be my bet. That's why I continue to hold precious metals. But whether that will work out in the short run, I don't know. I think precious metals may still go down a little further before the U.S. dollar weakens, and then precious metals should rally significantly. Is the Trump administration promoting a weak dollar policy, and what do you see ahead for the dollar? (laughs) Well, this is a good question. Uh, do they have a policy at all? <laughs> That's the question. They say this and then they do that, exactly the opposite. And so, so we don't know. But my impression is they want to redress the trade imbalances. And to redress the trade imbalances is very difficult if the dollar strengthens a lot. So my sense is that they would rather have a weaker dollar. And for this reason, I don't believe that the Fed will increase the Fed fund rate another three or four times this year. I think they will suddenly look at the strong dollar and say, well, if we have a strong dollar, it's a symptom of global tightening of liquidity, and we can't increase rates any further. We want to have a stable or weaker dollar. And at that time, say, next Fed fund rate increase in June may occur, but it's not guaranteed. But I think thereafter, when they see that the increase in interest rates, and don't forget, say, the two years Treasury note has already more than doubled in yield from the lows in 2016, equally the 10 years Treasury note. The yield has more than doubled from 1.38% to now essentially close to 3%. But some people say it will go the 10 years yield to 4% by year end. Now, these projections of 4% treasury yield by year end, if they occur and the Europeans don't increase rates and the Japanese don't increase rates, will, of course, strengthen the dollar considerably. But I don't think the administration really will want to have that occur. And so they will be reluctant to increase interest rates another three times. That's my impression. But just in case, since you asked me about the Dow Jones, some people say it will go up and some people say it will go down. Yes, it will go either way. But uh, if the 10-year Treasury note yield is at 4% by year end, uh, you will obviously lose money in bonds. But for sure, you will also lose money in stocks. I have no doubt about it. 
and maybe much more than in bonds. So this is something to keep in mind if you really think it through. I don't think that the 10-year Treasury note yield will go to 4%. I think the economy globally is weakening and not strengthening as well as in the U.S. I think the economy is weakening simply because the consumer doesn't have any money. Yet they point to unemployment officially being below 4% right now. Is that an artificial number? Well, I think the official numbers of unemployment being below 4% is probably correct. But the labor force consists of lots of people who don't want to work because they get enough benefit or they cannot find the jobs because they are... <laughs> To be politically correct, the village idiot, uh, they are unemployable. They are on drugs or they are un completely uneducated. They don't find jobs. So the labor pool has tightened because of a lack of supply of qualified workers. It is very difficult to find a qualified uh, technician, to find a qualified factory worker to find a qualified truck driver. I was a year ago in a pub, in an Irish pub in America, and by accident I met someone who had a trucking business in Baltimore. He said one of his biggest problems is to find suitable drivers because a lot of people who want to drive trucks are do not qualify because they are either drinking heavily or on drugs. The world continues to undergo geopolitical upheaval, but gold continues to trade in a range. Why doesn't gold seem to care? Well, I think uh, one of the reasons, but I'm not sure, uh, gold depends to some extent on speculators. And the speculators have all moved to cryptocurrencies. That's where the action is because it moves a lot in a day. I think the interest in cryptocurrencies will die out for the simple reason that uh, these uh, so-called experts that trade cryptos and they all acquired their expertise over a period of two years maximum. <laughs> so I think all these experts will eventually lose a lot of money. And it's actually interesting, over the last two years I met uh, so many people that never bought any stocks, that never bought any bonds, that never traded any commodities or foreign exchange, uh, they were all in cryptos. But I've never met anyone who admitted to me that he had lost money in cryptos. Never. They all told me to trade cryptos and so forth. More recently, these people who told me they are trading cryptos uh, you can uh, find them much less in bars. In other words, I'm sure they lost already a ton of money. We'll have more with Mark Faber next on This Week in Money. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. PowerVan Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX. For more information, please visit us at PowerVanSolutions.com. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp. RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain's Brunswick property is located in the Ridout Shear Zone in Ontario, with grab samples running as high as 32 grams per ton gold. A follow-up drill program to test numerous targets located by recent groundwork is planned for early 2018. Please visit our website at rmroyalty.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Mark Faber. He's the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report on gloomboomdoom.com. 
He's speaking to us from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Mark, going forward, do you have any price targets for gold and silver? Yes, my price target is uh, that uh, precious metals and all of them will go higher. I don't want to say how high they will go, but the way I look at the economic environment and the financial markets is this. I think uh, the central banks have gone this far in expanding their balance sheet, in other words, in, in printing money, that there is no way they can stop doing it. There are so many problems on the horizon if they stop printing money that sooner or later they will resume acquiring assets uh, on the balance sheet, in other words, printing money, increasing the quantity of money in the system. And I think at some point, investors will lose confidence in paper money. And this has to some extent already happened in the sense that investors have moved out of cash. They moved into real estate. They moved into stocks. They moved into bonds. They moved into commodities and collectibles and wines and so forth. And uh, in my view, when the asset inflation will occur, and it could occur any time, with the markets dropping 20-30%, the Fed and other central banks will realize that in an environment where the financial economy is a multiple in size of what the real economy is, that an asset price decline causes a lot of damage to really economic activity. And at that very point, they will say, well, we have to print more money. And then I think that uh, precious metals will be very strong. That's my opinion. Is the commitment of traders a good indicator for gold and silver? Well, in general, yes. Uh, when commercials are long and speculators are short, usually the commercials are right. But you understand nowadays, and this is a, a problem which I alluded to earlier on in the program, you have a lot of sophisticated speculators. They are hedge funds. They know the industries very well. They know the demand and the supply and so forth. So these statistics may at times not be all that relevant. But in general, I would say I'd be rather on the side of the commercials than of the speculators. And the commercials, relatively speaking, are now having a, either a, sh a small short position in silver and gold, or they may have moved to a net long position. Argentina has joined Venezuela as the land of hyperinflation, where their money is virtually worthless. Is anybody else in danger of joining the useless currency club? Well, I think the whole world is in the danger of having a further, I'm emphasizing further, incredible loss of purchasing power of paper money. I mean, when you look at the last hundred years and you see the price level today compared to, say, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, then it is, of course, much higher than it was before. If you look at the price level of stocks, uh, just consider, in 1982, the Dow Jones was below 800, and now we're close to, we are over 24,000, and we had all the dividends. So we had this colossal asset inflation, and uh, this loss of purchasing power of paper money with essentially close to zero interest rate, in my view, will continue in the long run. Now, can it be uh, relatively strong in the short run? In other words, can cash beat the asset prices in the short run? Yeah, of course, but for how long? You understand, if the housing market drops 30%, if stocks drop 30%, if Treasury bonds go to a 4% yield, as some experts say, then I think that the Fed will again print money. Actually, I'm convinced they will. Are we likely to see a three-digit oil price anytime soon? Again, uh, when the oil price was extremely depressed, 
people said it will never go up again, and now we're over around $70, and the projections that say oil will go to over $100, it's all possible. The question is uh, how likely it is. I think, in general, the demand for oil will go up, yes, but the supply has also increased, and at the moment economies like Venezuela and so forth uh, move to a more market-friendly economy, their supplies can increase dramatically. So I wouldn't bet here necessarily on far higher oil prices. Are banks around the world constricting credit? I don't think so, but the rise in interest rates has probably meant that some corporations that intended to borrow money before or some wealth to to individuals, they're not doing anymore. And we have had a significant deceleration of credit growth in the system. And this deceleration of credit growth, in my view, as I pointed out earlier, will show up in maybe three to five months in the economy, which by then will be weakening dramatically. Is sustained easy credit turning people into debt slaves? I find it actually disappointing or distressing to see lots of households and people who have to wait until the end of the month to get their salary in order to pay their credit card uh, debt and other debt. In other words, they are forced to work, otherwise they can't pay their debt, or they can't repay, but they can pay the interest, provided they have a job. But if they have no jobs, they can't even pay the interest. And I ask myself, what kind of life is this? You're basically free, you can vote, but you are a slave to the company you work for, and it may not always be easy for you to find a new job somewhere else. So you're kind of enslaved by debt. Yes, correct. Is the world drowning in debt bubbles? <laughs> yes. The world, that's an easy answer. Yes, the world is drowning in a debt bubble, a colossal debt bubble. But I remember in the early 80s, there were three Mary Lynch strategists who I thought were great economists. Stan Salvigson was one, and uh, the other one was Aaronston, Aaronstein, but I forgot his first name, and the third one was Charlie Minter. And they already thought then that the rising deficits of the U.S. would push interest rates up when actually at the time, the treasury yield was down, well, well, yes, from roughly 15% in 1981. It was down to around 10%. But it was still at 10%. And now we're, as you know, much lower. On the 10 years, we're slightly below 3%. So the credit expansion that we have ex- ex- uh, experienced as a percentage of the economy since the early 1980s, and not just in the U.S., but globally, is something amazing and was largely financed by central banks through their easy monetary policies and their own balance sheet expansion. And then you have to ask yourself, how long can this go on? And I can tell you, there's no way to know how long this can go on. It can go on for another few years. The only thing I can say, it will not end well. That is out of the question. It will end in a complete disaster. But exactly the sequence leading to the disaster, we don't know. Maybe for another five years, the best is to be long stocks. Maybe for another five years, the best is to be long the dollar. I doubt, but you understand, they are in terms of market movement, a lot of uncertainties. And for that reason, I recommend a diversification. And for that reason, I recommend actually to hold some precious metals, uh, mostly in physical form. We'll have more with Mark Faber next on This Week in Money. 
Bad Adventures Corp is a potash exploration company focused on the Korat Basin in Thailand, the world's largest undeveloped potash resource. Baddox management has extensive potash exploration and development experience in Thailand. Baddox will have marketing advantage compared to Western producers. Drill program commences this spring. Baddox trades on the TSX Venture, symbol VCV, and on Frankfurt, symbol V8V2. Visit our website, baddockventures.com. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Mark Faber. He's the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report at gloomboomdoom.com. He's speaking to us from Thailand. Mark, what do you see ahead for uh, interest rates and government debts? Are we all go- Are they just going to ignore them? How do we get around them? Well, again, that's a very good question. Say in Japan, if interest rates uh, double from here, basically all the tax revenues will have to be used to pay the interest on the debt. And in the U.S., obviously, if, say, interest rates on the government debt uh, increases to around 4%, uh, just the interest payments on the government debt will be over a trillion dollars a year because we had interest rates, average interest rates on the U.S. federal debt decline to around 2%. So a doubling of interest rates here will imply uh, interest rate payment of an average of around 4%. And the current interest charges on the federal debt are approximately $600 $600 billion, so a doubling would essentially imply just interest payments of around uh, or over a billion dollars a year. Uh, sorry, a trillion dollars a year. So this shows what the problem is of the Fed increasing interest rate. The liabilities go up very substantially. And then we have the corporate debt. The corporate debt is also at the record high. And not only the course of corporate debt, but the low quality corporate debt and the emerging market debt and the student loans and whatever you look at, an increase in interest rate uh, brought about by another three or four per, uh, four times interest rate increase by the Fed, in my opinion, will have a devastating impact on the economy, really negative. And that's why I don't believe they will do it. I think they will have to print more money. If interest rates rise, will that create a problem with the bond market bubble? Yes, for sure. That undoubtedly. But the problem may not last uh, for long right away. Because if you give the U.S. economy, say, 4% uh, 10-year Treasury note yield tomorrow, I think the U.S. would be in a massive recession. Massive. So for that reason, I think that the interest rate increase will not be permanent, but temporary. Then we can have, if the economy weakens, another decline in interest rate, maybe on the 10 years to around 2%. Are real estate markets around the world in trouble? Well, some are in trouble and some aren't, but there are lots of real estate markets in the U.S. that are today much higher, and I repeat, much higher and much further inflated than they were in 2007. In 2007, the housing bubble was concentrated largely in California (laughs) when Mrs. Yellen was the president of the Federal Reserve of San Francisco, and it was concentrated in Nevada. She was also supervising Nevada, 
and in Arizona and to some extent in Miami. But it was highly concentrated. Now, as you have heard, there is an expression, this bubble is the bubble in everything. And so most uh, real estate markets are at the highest they've ever been, and some by a huge margin. So I think the real estate market is in trouble to some extent, and uh, but the trouble will increase in future if interest rates increase. President Trump is lowering taxes in the U.S. Governments in Canada are hell-bent on raising taxes. Does this spell doom for the Canadian economy? Let's put it this way. I'm very skeptical about uh, all fiscal and monetary measures and their effectiveness. Mr. Trump has cut taxes, but not everybody is benefiting from this tax cut. And don't forget a lot of corporations in the U.S., they don't pay the stated uh, tax rate of, say, 35%. Lots of multinationals pay maybe 10 to 15% tax. So my view would be that uh, these tax cuts will not have much of an impact. If anything, they're more favorable for the rich people and more favorable for the corporate sector than for the individuals. And in Canada, the tax increases uh, and every tax increase, I'd like to say, is negative. What should happen is that uh, expenditures should be cut. We're hearing rumors President Trump wants to restructure the Fed. How do you think the Fed should be restructured? Maybe the best would be to get rid of central banks. I don't know. I mean, Milton Friedman, he made long arguments that uh, a computer should run the quantity of money and that the quantity of money should grow regularly at about the rate of nominal GDP increase, and no more and no less, and that it should not be at the discretion of a bunch of academics to vary the quantity of money or the money supply according to their whims. So, but I don't think that Trump will do that. If anything he will restructure the Fed to accommodate his uh, gigantic deficit. In other words, uh, under him, not less, but more money will be printed, in my opinion. Is President Trump doing a good job? Well, he's trying, but uh, he's his worst enemy. In my view, I would have voted for Mr. Trump for the only reason that I don't think that Hillary Clinton is acceptable in terms of morals, in terms of integrity, as a president of the United States. That is the only reason I would have voted against her. She is, uh, in my opinion, not honest. And Mr. Trump, he vowed to essentially clean the system, the drain the swamp, but that proves seemingly <laughs> to be very difficult. And I read on the periphery all these stories about the FBI and the CIA and the Department of Justice and the government and so forth. I mean, you really have to scratch your head and say, is anyone actually honest in Washington? Is that, I mean, really uh, an issue. But most people in the U.S. do not seem to care much. If they really cared, the market would be much lower, and the support for Mr. Trump trying to clean up the system would be higher. But economically speaking, uh, the problem with him, he lacks any understanding. He also lacks any understanding of diplomacy, and he doesn't understand that uh, foreign countries nowadays have become economically extremely powerful, notably China. And so the room to maneuver for the U.S. is much more limited than it was, say, in the 1950s or 1960s, when the U.S. was really the dominant economy in the world relative to the rest of the world, and it was also the dominant superpower. That is no longer the case. Is World War III becoming less likely? 
Well, uh, historically seen, uh, we had uh, from time to time major confrontation, and uh, we had uh, World War One, and we had World War Two, and the, in the Middle Ages we had the religious wars, and we had uh, earlier on in the eleventh uh, and twelfth century the invasion of the Mon- Mongols and so forth. So we always had the wars, and yes, I think that there will be wars again. And by the way, we are engaged to some extent in wars in the Middle East. Uh, these were wars that were created in order to destabilize Middle Eastern regimes. Uh, who knows for what, but uh, that was the case. And uh, there'll be more confrontation in future. We can't assume that for the next thousand years there will be world peace. But uh, equally, if you're looking after your money or if you're looking after a fund, uh, how would you position yourself if you assumed that there is World War Three? Would you put all your money into uh, defense stocks or would you put all your money in cash? In uh, a war period, I suppose that cash would be a disastrous investment because they would have to print money to finance the war. So all these things, is you can think about it and say, yeah, they may occur, but then the conclusion, the investment conclusion is, since we don't really know, uh, we need to probably uh, counter this risk by being diversified and owning some physical precious metals and uh, probably owning some properties and some stocks and maybe some cash. But you can't sit there and say, well, war will occur, and as a result of war, the best will be to be in cash or to be in gold. Who knows? Because gold should do well, theoretically. But if there is war and there's a tightening of liquidity, maybe it won't do that well. And there's a risk in war times that the government decides to declare some emergency measures under which, say, they would confiscate your gold. Do you think that's a reality, that Western governments would seize gold like they did back in the 30s? Well, I think it may happen, but uh, nowadays you have an option, and people know that it was expropriated once before. You have the option to store your gold essentially outside the U.S. or outside Canada in some other jurisdiction. That is a possibility. So, again, when I talk about diversification, it's not just the diversification into various assets, stocks, bonds, commodities, uh, real estate, precious metals. It's also diversification in terms of having some assets outside the jurisdiction where you live. Is China still printing a lot of money? Well, apparently the credit growth has slowed down, but then there are months when it accelerates again. But in general, I would say they're trying to reduce the credit growth. And so looking also at the Chinese currency, one doesn't get the impression that they're printing excessively money. But they also, like elsewhere in the world, they don't want to create a complete asset uh, meltdown, particularly not in the stock market and in the property market. In China, the leader has declared himself president for life. Is this good or bad for China's economy? I think at the moment it's irrelevant. And I think that uh, Chinese, and this is misunderstood in the Western world, they uh, don't really know what a democratic system is. They never had it. It's like the people of Hong Kong. They never had a democracy. And uh, similarly in uh, Russia, they had uh, maybe some kind of a democracy. But basically, they're used to a strong leader. And whether it's good or bad will depend whether Xi Jinping is a good leader or not. So far, he strikes me as a significantly more intelligent leader than what you had in the U.S. for the last 20 years or so. Is nationalism better than globalism for economic stability? 
Well, in principle, I'm for a free world and I'm from f for free trade and the free exchange of goods. And uh, to some extent, people, if they come to your country with the intention to work, if they come to your country with the intention to take advantage of the social security system, then I'm, of course, opposed to that kind of uh, migration. But equally, I think the world, and this we had in the Middle Ages, the Middle Ages in Europe were a time of rapid economic growth because different city-states, they didn't fought the wars with each other, but they competed economically against each other. And so that drove economic growth and innovation in Europe significantly. And I think it's good if we have a world where we have different countries and uh, different, uh, let's say, specialties, that one country is very good at producing agricultural goods, Another country is very good at producing fish. Another country is very good at high-tech and so forth and so on. And the exchange of these goods can be mutually beneficial. So I can't answer the question whether I favor nationalism or globalism. I think globalism is fine as long as it doesn't impose on people a global government that then controls everything and uh, suppresses the average person. Are you bullish on the junior mining markets? Well, it's very depressed, and some junior miners have actually done very well over the last two years. Just look at Kirkland Lake, but others haven't. But in general, the sector is very depressed. And as I said, I own precious metals. I have a preference for the physical metal. But I can see that uh, mining stocks, if the interest comes back into the system, into the sector, that these mining stocks could perform very well. Do you like the materials used for electric vehicle batteries? Well, I had about one and a half years ago someone write a lengthy article about cobalt. And the price has gone up a lot. He will now do a follow-up. Uh, yes. I like uh, that kind of commodity, but equally, I don't think that electric batteries will proliferate as fast as some analysts believe it, they will. Do you like the technology sector? Uh, no. If you look back at the last 50 years or so uh, in terms of technology stock, yes, some of them always went up, but then... All of them uh, began a long-term decline. The very few technology stocks that are today still the leaders. I mean, the first technology bubble we had in the U.S. was in the late 60s. Then we had stocks that were technology-related, like Polaroid and Xerox and so forth, and uh, most of them have gone out of business or are irrelevant. Then we had the technology boom relating to personal computers, Atari, Tandy, Commodore, all these stocks, Wang Labs. Most of them are out of business as well. And uh, then we had the Internet boom in the late 1990s. And there are a few survivors that have done well, but the bulk is still below the peak in 1999. And the current crop of technology stocks are mostly related to social media, and uh, to search engines and so forth. So I'd say, uh, given their high valuation, I don't think they're a good investment. Are they going to grow in the long run? Yes, but maybe not as much as people think. And given their valuation, even if they grow, they can decline in value significantly. Mark, can you tell us about the Gloom Boom and Doom Report and how people can find out more about it? Well, we have a website called... Uh, gloomboomdoom.com, all in one word, and uh, that's where they can subscribe to it. Mark, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Well, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, all the best. My guest has been Mark Faber. He's the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, and Doom Report at gloomboomdoom.com. Coming up, the publisher of wallstreet.com, Wolf Richter, next on This Week in Money. 
Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. A work program is planned for our Finland property that contains diamond-bearing kimberlite. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ADD, and the Frankfurt Exchange, symbol 82A1. Please visit our website at arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Wolf Richter, the founder of wolfstreet.com. He's speaking to us from San Francisco. Wolf, welcome back to This Week in Money. Well, thanks for having me back on your show. Wolf, let's talk about the car market. How are used vehicle sales and prices right now? Well, used vehicles don't really get that much attention. Uh, you know, we constantly hear about new vehicle sales and the new vehicle market, and that's important. Uh, yeah, new vehicles impact manufacturing and transportation, rail and truck and port installations and industry, I mean, insurance and finance, all kinds of things and dealers. So we don't hear much about used vehicles, but the used vehicle market is actually a lot larger. Uh, than the new vehicle market. In the United States, you sell about 17 million new vehicles per year uh, right now. And uh, used vehicles, it's more like 40 million uh, sold through the dealers. Not not individually, but uh, sold from uh, franchise uh, dealers and from independent dealers. So it's a, it's a vast market, and it underpins the new vehicle market. So it's got to have high used vehicle prices in order to obtain the high trade-in values that you need on the new car side to make car deals and uh, to have high new vehicle sales volume. So you need high used vehicle prices on that side. Um, on the other hand, uh, used vehicles compare uh, compete with, with new cars uh, substantially. So a franchise dealer, so a Ford dealer, for example, uh, may have, a whole bunch of new vehicles on the lot and may have a hundred used vehicles on the lot. And of those hundred used vehicles, some of them are trading, but many of them he bought at the Ford, at the auctions. And so these are, are, uh, rental cars and lease turn ins that are one year, two years, three years old and have often relatively low mileage and look very similar to the new vehicles he has on the lot. And, uh, so when a customer has trouble, uh, stepping up to the price of a new vehicle, the salesman just automatically takes them over to the used car lot and where they can buy a similar car for, you know, ten or fifteen thousand dollars less. And it looks kind of the same. And so there's a huge amount of competition between the two, but at the same time the used vehicle market also forms the foundation for the new vehicle market. So we've got to keep that in mind. And the used vehicle market is incredibly liquid. Uh it's uh uh it's not particularly regulated. There are there's a huge uh, wholesale market in it. So Mannheim, for example, is one of the largest auction companies in the world, and they have auctions around the United States and in Canada too, uh, and just every major market. And uh, they sell in these wholesale auctions. They sell the uh, lease turn-ins. They sell the rental cars. They sell uh, all kinds of other vehicles from insurance companies. They sell repos. Everything goes through these auctions. And uh, they will take cars to uh, markets where the supply is uh, uh, slightly lower than in some other markets, so it balances out, and they try to, you know, to get the maximum pricing. And what we have seen in these in this wholesale market, and again, we're talking about millions of vehicles going through this, so this is very large numbers, very liquid. Um, and in this wholesale market, what we've seen is that the hurricanes, Harvey and Irma, have caused a spike in prices. And at one point, uh, the spike reached about 8% year over year in October last year, and that was the peak. And uh, then the prices fell back down, and the, the Mannheim tracks this with an index, 
and uh, and that that spike in prices was expected. Uh, it wasn't expected that it would drop that quickly, um, and then something happened this year. Just now, the prices began to rise again, and uh, used vehicle prices on going through their auction there are now six percent higher than they were a year ago. And a year ago, they were already higher than in the prior years. So we have seen a very uh, significant uptick in prices in used vehicles that is now transcending the hurricane and uh, uh, from already fairly uh, high prices to start with. Now, we, we had a brief period in 2016 and early 2017 when used vehicle prices came under pressure from uh, rental cars and um, uh, lease turn-ins that just uh, uh, flooded the auctions. And uh, that 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 ended. You know, that ended last year in uh, in March or April, sometime around that time. And since then, prices have been kicking up, and and now they're they're, they're rising significantly. Uh, the interesting part about this is also that the vehicles that are dust on the new car side, so cars, uh, especially compact cars, they're really hot on the used car side. And SUVs and compact SUVs are crossovers that are really hot on the new car. On the new vehicle side, yeah. they are not doing particularly well on the used vehicle side. So it's going through the auction. So the, uh, the pro- in terms of the price increases. Uh, so what, what we, what we have here now is customers walking into a car dealership and they're looking at a new car and they're seeing that, uh, they can price a compact car, you know, they can buy a uh, rental car uh, from the other side of the lot uh, for thousands of dollars less, and they appear to be doing that. And uh, so new car sales in the United States have gotten crushed every year for the last, since, since 2015, you know, that, and Ford is now, has announced that it will uh, get out of uh, the manufacturing of new of cars in the United States. You know, they will shut down the manufacturing plants building cars in the United States. They will stop selling cars in the United States except for the Mustang. That's in the future of Ford. Yeah, GM has already announced that it will slash several uh, car lines. Uh, FCA has already done that. So, uh, you know, cars are just, new cars are just not selling in the United States, whereas pickups and SUVs and compacts, uh, compact SUVs are really hot. So they're selling really well on the new car side. On the used car side, cars are doing well. So uh, this is the, the, the kind of the conundrum that we have. Wolf, in the new vehicle market, what percentage of people pay full retail when buying or leasing vehicles? When they're buying a new car, uh, very few people end up paying sticker price for retail. Uh, there, there are some brands that sell a sticker, but in terms of the mass volume cars, uh, these are negotiated prices. And especially on the new car side, uh on the car side, not on the SUV side, you know, there, there's huge amounts of discounts now offered by manufacturers to move these vehicles and the dealers offer discounts, uh, on SUVs and pickups too, you know, a lot of incentives offered by manufacturers. So, uh, retail price, the sticker price on new vehicles is almost irrelevant. Uh, this time it's inflated. It's a price that has gone up way faster than the market can bear. So, so they, uh, the manufacturers and dealers were offering all kinds of incentives and price reductions to get that down to where people can afford them. And, you know, it is all negotiable. Uh, however, in, that's in terms of buying. You know, in terms of leasing, and it's an interesting situation because when you're leasing a vehicle, you're actually not buying it. You know, you're renting it. And so there's no retail price. You don't really know as when you lease a car, you don't really know what the retail price is. What happens is the dealer will sell the car to a financing company, which will, you know, lease the car to you. So uh, you have a uh, leasing arrangement with a finance company. The finance company owns the car, and you don't know uh, how much the dealer got for that car that he sold to the finance company. So uh, when I was in the business back then, leases were our most profitable deals, and a lot of times you could actually sell a car to the finance company at retail. So we would get retail price for it. Uh, and when the finance company leased it uh, to the customer, the customers were happy because the uh, monthly payments were relatively low. 
and uh, you know, and of course they they pay upfront money. He, and somebody said, you know, you can lease a Boeing for seven hundred dollars a month if you pay enough money up front. And uh, <laughs> which is true with car leases too. Yeah, you pay enough money up front, and the monthly lease payment goes down. The monthly lease payment is also dependent uh, largely on the resale value of the vehicle at the end of the lease, uh, which is estimated at the beginning of the lease. So it's a very complicated calculation, and and you don't really know what the retail price is. Uh, all this is negotiated at the dealer uh, between the customer and the dealer. Um, so you don't really come in contact with the finance company, but uh, in terms of the price negotiation, it's really a, a, a three-party deal. You know, you've got the dealer, you've got the finance company, and you've, you've got the customer. And uh, uh, and profit margins are higher on leases simply because of that, because they're very hard to shop around. Uh, they're complex, uh, they're complex structures. There are a lot of elements involved. And uh, yeah, if you get your monthly payments and you're happy with it, you go with it. And at the same time, you may have, uh, via your finance company, you, know, you may have paid full sticker for that lease car. Um, so it's hard to say on leases. Uh, on new vehicle purchases, outright buys, almost nobody pays for retail. Are we likely to see auto dealer bankruptcies and liquidations in the future? There will, there are always some. There are always some auto dealers that don't make it uh, in in good years and bad years. Uh, being a dealer means being extremely leveraged. Uh, uh, franchise dealers uh, uh, are highly leveraged uh, uh, companies, uh, including the inventories. Uh, you know, they have floor plan arrangements. Uh, you know, they they uh, oftentimes can use the parts. Uh, uh, security the land uh, is collateral for the loans you know so um, you have to know what you're doing and if your profits aren't large enough to to, to cover your debt service you know sooner or later uh, you'll you'll go out of business but if it's a reasonably good market you'll have other uh, dealers stand in line to take over the franchise so uh, in terms of the manufacturer, it doesn't really matter whether a dealer goes out of business or not. And uh, in, in, yeah, it's, it's tough being a dealer, and, and you have to be fairly good to make it. Uh, but I don't expect a wave of uh, dealer bankruptcies. Uh, dealers make a lot of money on used cars. So even if, uh, used, if the new vehicle market gets in real trouble, which it, it's not in real trouble. I mean, the sales are declining a little bit, but... The uh, the overall market is not collapsing like it did during the financial crisis. Yeah. Uh, but dealers have uh, access to to used vehicles, uh, so they can make a lot of money off of those. Uh, even if the new vehicle sales are slowing down, uh, also dealers make a lot more money in the back end, so parts and service, uh, than they make on the front end. So uh, if you know how to run a dealership, it's a profitable business. Uh, even in in uh, in iffy times, are subprime auto loans and long amortizations causing financial hardships for consumers? Yeah, subprime auto loans um, are uh, you know loans that are given to people or extended to people with uh, with relatively low credit scores. So generally, that's a, a FICO score of six hundred and twenty or below, and that means these people have already uh, had some credit difficulties in the past, uh, so they're, they're higher risk customers. It's, it's comparable to uh, companies that have a chunk credit rating, and they all have to pay high interest rates. Now, the problem with subprime auto lending is a lot of times a customer does, feels like they don't have a choice, and so they go to a dealer to buy a vehicle, and the dealer sees the credit score, and it's relatively low, and instead of trying to get the car financed through a bank or one of the captive finance companies from the automakers, which don't really, uh, which are really careful with subprime uh, customers now, uh, they'll, they'll go to a specialized subprime lender. And uh, there the interest rates are suddenly very high. So a customer that pays 15% interest on a car loan, uh, it's very likely uh, to default on that loan because the interest rate is so high. And uh, so these are the customers with uh, with income problems, with credit problems. They're at least able to afford a high interest rate, yet they're the ones that end up with a high interest rate. 
So it, uh, it's a very risky business. Uh, right now, subprime auto lending is in deep trouble. They've done a lot of uh, sloppy underwriting over the past few years and uh, lent a lot of money uh, on, on overpriced vehicles to customers that can't really afford them, and they've charged some interest rates that are way too high. So these auto loans are now deteriorating at a very rapid rate. Uh, especially those loans that are given uh, that were extended by uh, specialized subprime lenders. We've already had two smaller lenders collapse. Uh, the banks are exposed to those uh, smaller subprime lenders because they actually lent money to them, and uh, uh, so that's uh, that's an exposure. Uh, in terms of consumers, yeah, you know, a, a consumer would be better off if they have a bad uh, credit history. It would be better off to get the the cheapest possible car, get the least amount of finance pay the most cash down, and really watch the interest rate, make sure the interest rate is not too high. When you, got, when you get ripped off, as a subprime customer, you know, you're, you don't have a lot of options, and you're becoming very vulnerable to getting ripped off. And that's happening. I mean, that's why the subprime industry is so profitable in good times, and they're taking big risks, and, and they're ripping customers off. And then, obviously, the customers can make the payments, and they fall. And so then the industry, uh, two, three, four years later, sees the fallout from that, and that's that's the face we're in right now. Um, it is, you know, it's a double-edged sword. On one hand, uh, customers with bad credit, you know, they need vehicles too, and they can't be excluded from the market. On the other hand, because they have bad credit, they do have to pay higher interest rates. That's just that's just how it works. You know, that's a higher risk customer, so uh, the lender needs to make up for uh, for the risk by charging higher rates. At the same time, if the rate is too high, you almost guarantee a default. So, uh, you know, there's a balance in that. And banks have been pretty good about it. Uh, you know, big banks are they're doing sub, some subprime lending, but they're very careful about it. They use good underwriting to verify the income, and uh, they make sure the car is too overpriced. Uh, or specialized subprime lenders, they don't really, uh, they don't really get. Get into those careful underwriting. They're just trying to make deals, and a lot of times they're they're owned by PE firms, and uh, some of them are traded uh, in the, uh, on the stock exchange. Uh, so it's you know it's it's really a double-edged sword, and, and you want to give people a loan that have a bad credit at the same time. You know you've got to be paid to do that because it's high risk. You have a 10 percent to 15 percent chance of losing quite a bit of money on this loan. We'll have more with Wolf Richter next on This Week in Money. I'm Brian Fowler, president of Blind Creek Resources Limited, listed on the TSX Venture Exchange, ticker symbol BCK. Blind Creek is focused in the Yukon, Northwest Territories, and British Columbia. The company's key property is the Blend Project, one of the largest undeveloped lead-zinc silver deposits in Western Canada, plus plans to advance the recently acquired, fully permitted historic engineer gold mine in the Atlan District of Northwestern BC. Check us out at blindcreekresources.com. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features to our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE symbol CRL and the pink symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Wolf Richter from WolfStreet.com. He's speaking to us from San Francisco. Wolf, electric vehicles right now make up a very small percentage of the auto market. Can you see any new innovations that could significantly increase their market share, or is it just going to be a matter of very high gasoline prices driving people into electric? Well, high gasoline prices would certainly do the job. <clears throat> the big problem right now is the cost of the batteries. The electric vehicle drivetrain, so the electric motor, is very simple. And it's old as technology. I mean, there's, there's innovations in it all the time, but they're relatively minor. You know, there were electric vehicles running around uh, uh, competing with steam-powered vehicles before the internal combustion engine was even invented. So that's been around for a long time. The problem is 
back then was the battery, and uh, today the, the the problem is still the battery. Uh, they've gotten a lot better. They're getting better every year, but the issue of uh, pricing is still still there. So with the current gasoline prices, it's very difficult for automaker to profitably sell an electric vehicle because of the price of the battery. The actual car is cheaper to build because you don't have, uh, your engine is just, just a little electric motor. You don't have emission control systems. You don't have cooling systems. You don't have fuel systems. You don't have a transmission. You don't have drive cams. You don't have all of the stuff that makes up uh, the bulk of the powertrain of a car. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, if you look at an electric car under the hood, a lot of times they have a storage compartment there. Um, it's just that's really simple to build. Maintenance is really low. Uh, the yeah you know, the the way electric motor functions, uh, it has a uh, nearly flat torque curve, which is great for performance driving, which is great for city driving. It's great for hauling. I mean, electric motors are really uh, are really great, and uh, uh, it just all comes down to the battery. So the innovation has to happen at the battery. It has to happen at the on the cost side. So they have to become cheaper. They're getting cheaper, but it's still it's still not the case. So every manufacturer now offers every major one. You know, offers uh, electric vehicles, but they're they're just sort of uh, yeah putting the toe in the water. They they want to uh, experiment with them. They want to um, uh, yeah get some feedback from customers. They want to have the name out there. But they're not really advertising them. They're not pushing them. They're not really making them in large numbers. Uh, they're just, uh, just trying to, you know, to create, uh, activity within the company and among, uh, and in the market to support future, uh, EV sales. And, uh, uh, yeah, the major manufacturers are now, uh, designing whole product lineups, but everybody's still waiting for the batteries. And nobody wants a sudden surge in battery production because the, the supply chain for batteries is really limited, and lithium is a big problem. So there, there's not enough lithium being produced uh, to support the batteries needed, uh, to build the batteries needed for for millions of electric cars uh, per year. So it, it will have to ramp up gradually, and uh, so that lithium can be produced in larger quantities, so that batteries can be produced in larger quantities, so that the supply chains get built gradually. Uh, and that the prices uh, can come down, and I think that that's what will will happen. Um, the the surveys that, that we read every year show that there's more and more uh, desire among consumers to drive electric cars, and uh, yeah, that people are interested. More and more people are thinking the next car might be electric, so this is starting to enter mainstream. But the prices are still not there, and with current gasoline prices, you, know, you have to do the math and see what your electricity rates are, how much you drive, what your you know what your gasoline consumption, what your maintenance you have to throw in your maintenance. So not tires uh, with and brakes, you know, which which uh, also are an expense on an electric car, but uh, engine type maintenance and uh, the oil changes and all kinds of things, and. Uh, uh, you don't have those on an electric car, so you, you have to do the math. And right now, the math is not particularly favorable for electric cars. Electric cars have big advantages. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, if you have a garage, you can just plug it in overnight. You don't have to go to the gas station anymore and fill up with gas on the way to work, uh, which for a lot of guys is no problem, but uh, some women would really rather not do that. And uh, and even I don't like to do it. When I'm in a hurry, I don't like to go to the gas station and, and fill up. I mean, that's, uh, uh, you know, that's not a good thing to do. And my wife, uh, she takes a car to work, and, and she does it. But, you know, she'd rather not do it. And so if she, if she could just plug in the car at night and uh, and leave for work the next morning, and that would be a big benefit to her. So these are things to consider. It's just... Uh, it's just a little short on the dollar side. You know, we're still waiting for that battery to come down in price enough to where electric cars are actually as cheap or cheaper than a gasoline-powered car. And that time will come. You know, that's not um, that's not that far away anymore. But when that happens, I think uh, you will see a surge in demand. And, of course, that's another problem. Then then we run into the issue of not being able to build enough batteries with the current lithium production we have in place. 
And this all needs to build up over time. Yeah, This can't happen uh, from one day to the next. So uh, a techno- technological change like this, going from gasoline power to electric, um, it's, a, it's a very gradual process. I mean, you have to change the entire supply chain all around, you know, and, and so I would expect this, this transition to be fairly gradual. And uh, I mean, if you get to 10% in EV sales uh, over the next few years, you know, that would be pretty good. It still will make up only a tiny portion of the overall fleet out there, uh, but, you know, it, it's, just, uh, it's just a gigantic change for a huge industry. Is Tesla in trouble? Yes. Uh, in deep trouble and, uh, they're, uh, the way I see it, their big problem is that the more they sell, the more money they lose and the more cash they burn. And, uh, they have now had, uh, three quarters, four quarters in a row of just, uh, baffling losses. $900 million in the last quarter. Um, yeah, they're, the more they sell, the more they lose. I mean, that, that's the ground rule. When Tesla only sold, uh, you know, a thousand cars a month or something, you know, the losses were relatively small. Uh, now it's time to sell more. It's time to ramp up production of its, uh, Model 3 and, um, and it's, it's just burning cash, uh, at insane rates. And there's no real, uh, let up in sight. You know, it's not that the design is bad. Uh, except they don't know how to manufacture at a mass production level. And they they don't know how to do that in a profitable manner. And, uh, yeah, so a normal company would long ago have gone bankrupt. Tesla has been funded by investors, uh, both uh, bond investors and stock market investors, um, with, with, uh, <laughs> without any compunction. I mean, these, these investors, these people are true believers and they hope that they somehow can, can go on and, and when investors keep hoping that and keep funding the company, it can hope. It can go on. But, uh, you know, this money gets burned and the way Tesla, uh, raised this, this money, these many billions of dollars is by selling stocks to the public in various follow-on offerings and by selling bonds. And it has $11 billion in debt now. Uh, there's interest due on this debt. Um, uh, you know, the CEO must came out and said that Tesla doesn't need to raise money this year. It's very unlikely uh, Tesla will have to raise money this year or <laughs> or collapse. Yeah. And it will burn up what it has uh, before the year's up. It will have to raise more money. So uh, that will turn out to have been another of many uh, lies that we've heard from the company and uh, uh, yeah so you know as soon as investors and this is a lot of institutional investors too you know, as soon as investors are starting to step back and say look I don't really feel like funding this anymore uh, then you will have a real problem and as long as investors keep throwing the billions of dollars at this company and keep funding it and keep funding its losses and its cash burn you know it can go on but there's yeah, when there's a change of mind among investors and there's already started to major doubts out there, you know, uh, it, it'll be over. The, you know, when, when the stock price of Tesla goes down into the single digit, the avenues of raising new money for Tesla will be closed. It will not be able to raise new money. It will have to make do with what it has. And it will have to figure out how to profitably build cars uh, like, like other car companies. And, uh, uh, and there has been no pressure on Tesla to do this. Tesla has always gotten new money. Yeah? So, so far, the company has not been pressured, has not been disciplined into doing this. And, uh, and I don't think Tesla is a real automaker until it can profitably build cars. And it's a million miles away from that. It, it has no idea how to profitably build cars. These are the best of times. You know? the, the, the auto market is very healthy. And, and uh, uh, you know, if you can't make money in this market, in what market are you going to be able to make money in? So uh, right now, uh, I'm just waiting for confidence among investors to to falter. And when that happens, uh, Tesla will be in a struggle for its life. I mean, it, it will it will get really ugly uh, because there's just it, they they will have to redo the, the way they're doing business. I mean, you cannot run an automaker that has no clue how to mass produce cars in a profitable manner. You just it just doesn't work, you know, and you can't you can't do that. So 
um, yeah, that's the trouble Tesla has. It's it's a financial issue and it's a manufacturing issue. With the pendulum apparently swinging from globalism to nationalism, how could vehicle markets be affected? I'm not sure that there is any industry with a more global supply chain than the auto industry. Uh, uh, that's a truly globalized supply chain. So when a, when a U.S. automaker, for example, assembles a car in the United States, the components might come from China, and the subcomponents may be shipped from Mexico to China. And some of the parts that are in those subcomponents that are made in Mexico may come from the United States. And uh, this goes all over the world. I mean, there's uh, thousands of parts in a car that are made all over the world. And uh, they, these are very sophisticated supply chains. And the auto industry is really worried about uh, uh, disruption in that supply chain. And it's not where cars are assembled. I mean, that's, that's the big part that we're looking at, the big assembly plants where all these components and assemblies are being put together. Yeah, it's where the, the parts are coming from, where the, the subcomponents and components are being made. Yeah. And from, from chips, there's a lot of computer uh, equipment on a car nowadays, a lot of software. There's all kinds of things, yeah. And um, where this is made, how it's being put together, uh, how it's being sourced. I mean, these are really, uh, truly global issues. And very sophisticated uh, systems have been set up to do this. So uh, a disruption of that uh, will have a, a very big impact. I, I don't think that uh, governments around the world are uh, w- eager to to disrupt the the supply chains of the auto industry. I can't imagine that they're trying to do this because it gets very difficult then uh, to, uh, to to maintain production. And uh, uh, so, I mean, it will take years to to rearrange those supply chains. It's not something you can do from one month to the next. And, you know, to, to pay uh, tariffs is one thing, you, so costs will go up a little bit. But when it disrupts things, when you suddenly can't get parts anymore from your current supplier, or, uh, you know, when things get, when some, some companies go out of business because they can't, uh, you know, do what they're supposed to do, what they're all planning on doing, those kind of things, when it disrupts uh, the suppliers, um, you know, then you'll really have chaos on your hands. And I don't think governments are eager to do that. I mean, I think they'll try to work through that, and they will try to to uh, allow global automakers to maintain their supply chain, even if uh, tariffs are imposed on some of the components and or even on, on finished cars. Uh, I mean, tariffs is just a, it's just a form of tax, and, and the industry can get over that. But a supply chain disruption would be catastrophic. Are easy money, low interest rates, and debt bubbles turning people into debt slaves? Yeah, the debt slave is sort of a, a, a tongue-in-cheek phrase that I use. Um, uh, I try to apply a little bit of humor to a, a tough situation. Uh, it, it indicates that when, for example, you buy a house, as you do in Canada, with a adjustable rate mortgage, uh, so you, you pay an inflated price, um, then interest rates go up, so your mortgage payment goes up since it's an adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, then the house price goes down. And you finance the down payment by borrowing money from from other sources. So now you can't sell the house because uh, you won't be able to get enough for it to pay off your loan. And uh, your your payments go up. So you're stuck with the house. You're stuck with making higher payments that are now difficult to make. And that's sort of the the definition of a debt play. Uh, in tongue in cheek definition. We and and. You know, I use that, uh, for, <laughs> for my fellow Americans because, you know, we're, we're very happy to pile on debt and it has had uh, negative consequences in the past. Now, debt never hurts <clears throat> the top, you know, 60% uh, of income earners or, uh, the spectrum of wealth in terms of the household. It hurts the lower sectors, the lower 20%. That's where it hurts. And the mortgage crisis in the United States uh, was caused by about 8% of the mortgages defaulting. Those mortgages uh, were mostly in the lower income spectrum. And, uh, you know, and it, it, uh, with, with people that were more fragile, that lost their jobs and suddenly 
that didn't have the savings to, to make the mortgage payments for out of savings and so forth. So uh, this is the the population that's risk. So when you talk about debt place, you know, you're worried about the people that are the most fragile, that are uh, you know two paychecks away from bankruptcy, um, that are really stretching to make the mortgage payments, that uh, have charged up their credit cards to the maximum and they just make the minimum payments. And they really don't have any any room left. There's no savings in their in the bank. And uh, anything small happening to that household uh, can cause a catastrophic financial disruption for them. And uh, uh, and that has been encouraged by low interest rates. So when it when interest rates were really low uh, and lending was really loose, uh, a lot of the people have gone, have stretched way too far to buy things. And that's credit cards. It's auto loans, but it's also mortgages. And mortgages are the biggest part of uh, consumer loans in the United States as well as Canada. And, uh, uh, you know, when, when home prices are rising, mortgages are never a problem. Mortgages are only a problem when home prices are going down because that, now you can't sell the house to pay off the mortgage. When, when home prices uh, fall, and they don't have to fall very far to do this, when they fall 15%, which is not, historically speaking, from what we've seen, which is not far, you know, at that point, if you bought a house the last couple of years, last few years, you can't sell it anymore. You're stuck. And at the same time, uh, you may not be able to make your mortgage payment. So that's when, that's when you're, you know, you're defaulting on your mortgage. And, uh, uh that has been encouraged by low interest rates. And now we have, uh, uh, that, that, that era is, is ending. Uh, central banks are raising interest rates. The, the Fed is, uh, is taking on a very hawkish tone. Uh, it's going gradually, so it's already into the rate high cycle for two and a half years. Uh, if it uh, keeps on going like this, the whole rate, rate high cycle will last five years, so it's very gradual. Everybody has time to adjust to it. Uh, but the last rate high cycle lasted two years, you know, so it, it, uh, it was quick and fast and it caused the financial crisis. Now it's, uh, it's gonna be dragged out for, you know, for twice as long or three times as long. But it's essentially going to do the same thing, but much more slowly. It will make debt much more expensive, and it will uh, put pri- uh, pressures on asset prices. Uh, and the, the most fragile borrowers, the most fragile households, will come under the most pressure because they're, uh, yeah, some of their debts will go up in price. Uh, some of their you know, the house uh, may become worth less. Um, you know, the credit cards. Will get more expensive, and you know, it may be harder to get new credit cards. Uh, so this is always the hangover after a uh, period of low interest rates. You have too much debt, uh, and that's the corporate sector too, not just uh, households. Corporate sector as well, and the household sector in Canada is particularly fragile. With they you know, in Canada, you've not had that deleveraging during the financial crisis. You really haven't had a financial crisis. Uh, like we have in the United States, and many households uh, deleveraged via defaults and bankruptcies, and got rid of part of the debt. You know? and, and so that helped bring household debt down quite a bit. And uh, uh, so it is low interest rates always cost that. So this is a known price to pay. Uh, now we're in the hangover period, and it's just starting, uh, and it will it will cost uh, some damage uh, among the most fragile households. From an outsider looking in, how does the Canadian real estate market look? In Toronto, and especially in Vancouver, uh, there is a massive real estate bubble that is obvious to everybody. I don't know that it's bigger than the one in San Francisco where I am. I, I, I kind of think we've got the biggest bubble of all here. But uh, but Vancouver is probably very close, and Toronto is not that far behind. And... Uh, uh, so, you know, in those two cities, uh, there, there, I think there, there's some major, uh, changes, changes coming up. In Toronto already, uh, home prices are sinking, uh, year over year. You know, the prices are already down in the, in the high end, uh, sales have frozen, uh, in the two million dollar and above. You know, it's very difficult now to even sell a house in, in Toronto. Um, the overall market volume is way down, so this is these are the signs that uh, uh, sellers aren't willing to to cut their prices enough, and that buyers aren't willing uh, 
to accept the prices that sellers want. So volume just there's a gap, you know, the gap can't be bridged, and so volume sort of sort of freezes up. And uh, uh, when that happens, uh, and people have to sell at some point, uh, then they will have to cut prices further to find interested buyers. And and uh, that's definitely happening in Toronto. I think Vancouver is not quite there yet. Um, San Francisco is probably about a year behind Toronto the way I see the the chart right now. Uh, so I'm I'm going to look at Toronto and see how it uh, works out there. And and this is what we'll probably get done here. Um, but uh, there are other cities in Canada that are not uh, as overpriced. And um, yeah, so there's a kind of a local problem. In but those are the two biggest housing markets in Canada, and and they're the the most impacted by this. Um, now, interest rates are going up. Most of the mortgages in Canada are adjustable rates, so mortgage payments will go up um, for for many people. The qualifying rate in Canada is already over 5%, so the, the rate that under the new regime uh, you have to be able to qualify for your mortgage, that's already over 5%. Uh, that makes uh, that requires a lot of income uh, in order to uh, to get a mortgage for the homes at the current prices. So um, and I think the Canadian housing market is facing uh, a lot of headwinds. Um, it, it'll be gradual. The Bank of Canada is not really interested in making the problem a lot worse. So I think it will be very uh, uh, slow in rate. It will raise interest rates, but it will do it very slowly. And uh, it will take a page from the Fed and maybe slow it down further. In the United States, we're not that exposed to rising interest rates in the housing market because most of our mortgages are fixed rate. So unless you need to buy a home, you might not feel the rate increases. Whereas in Canada, that's not the case. So in, in, in most mortgages in Canada, the homeowner feels the rate increase either pretty quickly, depending on what mortgage it is, or a few years down the road. Uh, and yeah, so it impacts current homeowners as well as the overall market. In terms of uh, in terms of sales, so um, and I, I think uh, uh, the housing market in Canada is uh, will have a lot of head, already has a lot of headwinds. How is the U.S. real estate market doing? And I'm not sure, uh, and I suspect actually that what we're seeing right now is a uh, an effort to buy a home before interest rates go up even further. The 30-year fixed rate mortgage rate, our this is our our standard mortgage down here, uh, is it, it, now approaching five percent. It's just yeah, you know, it's at 4.8, 4.6, 4.7, 4.8% in that range, yeah. And uh, it that's a significant move. When it gets to six percent, which could happen next year if the current uh, if the current rate the, the forecast rate increases pan out. Uh, that will make it almost impossible for many households to buy at the current prices. Uh, so right now, and households know that. So right now, they're trying to lock in the lower rates, and we've seen a spurt in activity around the country. Uh, home prices uh, in most markets have have gone up quite a bit. Uh, and they've gone up on a national basis, um, and at this point. Um, I don't see any any immediate declines. You know, they, what I see is people trying to get some get to get into a house before the rates go up further because they can't afford it anymore. And then you know, there's some tax issues too. We've got a, a new tax plan here uh, that takes out some of the tax benefits of home ownership. Uh, that doesn't seem to be impacting um, the market right now uh, because people can't really they haven't really seen it yet what it does. They will see it. Uh, eventually, but uh, it, it hasn't really. This is our first year, which has started with this new tax plan, so it really hasn't uh, it hasn't shown up on the, on the tax returns yet. But that will be a factor uh, to, to to contend with. But at this point, right now, we ha- yeah, the public is looking at rising interest rates, uh, and they're thinking, oh my god, oh my god, I need to get some now before I can't afford it anymore, and uh, that is pushing up the market at this point. Uh, the, that's the that's the best I can see, and uh, and I think up through five percent it will it will hold up. Once it gets way past five percent, as it approaches six percent, uh, it it the, the math won't work anymore, and uh, there'll be a, a significant decline. Wolf, how can you tell when a real estate market is bottoming? 
that's probably one of the hardest things to determine the exact month or the exact <laughs> uh, yeah moment when the bottom takes place in real estate. Real estate is slow moving. So the data that you're looking at is already old by the time you see it. Uh, transactions take a long time to, to get done. So by the time a, 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 a deal closes, it may be two months after it was originally agreed on. Ah. So you don't really know in the data, uh, when you look at the data, whether the, uh, yeah, whether the market has turned or not. It's also very noisy, the data. So it jumps up and down quite a bit. So you don't know whether that's just part of the noise at first or whether that's a real change in trend. Um, so it is very tough to, to time the, the bottom or the top. Of, uh, of the real estate market. Uh, there's anecdotal things when, you know, when some of the people are getting, uh, yeah, some of the people with money are getting pretty excited about investing in it. Um, and when the smart money moves into things that it doesn't normally move into, uh, you know, that will be an indication. Um, and of course, with hindsight, you know, if you have one year's worth of hindsight, you can probably think, okay, so that might have been the bottom. Uh, but then you're one year already into the, uh, recovery, and you may have already missed the best deals, which happen right at the bottom. So, uh, timing the bottom is incredibly difficult in real estate. And, and I, um, I mean, when it gets low enough and you want to buy, that's just the time you have to buy. And, and, um, and I, I know that from personal experience, you know, I bought a condo during the oil bust in Oklahoma, and I waited for, for two years that, that whole condo thing went into litigation because of a bankruptcy. Um, the bank finally ended up with it. When I bought from it, I bought from the bank, and I got a really good deal. By that time, the price had fallen like 60%. <laughs> and uh, uh, then the bank goes bankrupt, gets taken over by the FDIC, which is our government uh, regulator of banks. And uh, then uh, a guy buys the opposite unit of mine, which is the exact same unit, for like another 20 or 25% less than I bought at from, from the FDIC. So uh, you never really know what the bottom is until you look back uh, with enough years, and then you say, "Yeah, that was the bottom." But when you when you're in it, you don't know. And uh, so, as I, if you buy and you want to buy, uh, and you want to try to find the bottom, you just end up having to buy when it's when the deal is good enough, and it may not be the bottom. You know, it's going to be it's going to drop a little more, maybe. Yeah, it's going to drop maybe another thirty percent. But uh, if it's good enough, if you can make the math work, then, yeah, that's what you'll have to do. Is the Fed slowing down the printing of money? The Fed stopped printing uh, in September 2014. That's the end of the taper. It then maintained its assets on its balance sheet, and then last year it announced that it would actually start, quote-unquote, roll off um, some, some of those assets. That started in October, just in tiny little baby steps. It is now increasing the steps. So every quarter, the the pace goes up. In October, it was ten billion dollars for that uh, fourth quarter, and the first quarter it was twenty billion dollars a month. Now we're in the second quarter, and it's thirty billion dollars a month. And uh, this Treasury and mortgage-backed security it is uh, uh, it, it the way it sheds them is it allows them uh, to mature and and. It doesn't replace them, so it doesn't actually sell them. It, it allows them to mature. And every month, there are $35 billion or so in treasuries maturing on the Fed's balance sheet and uh, and more than that in mortgage-backed security. So there's always a lot of stuff maturing that it can, it can choose not to replace, and that's how it's doing that. And uh, so this quarter, second quarter, it'll be $30 billion a month or $90 billion for the second quarter combined. In the third quarter, the Fed will shed forty billion a month, and in the fourth quarter, it will begin shedding fifty billion a month. And fifty billion a month is six hundred billion a year. And the the, the approach is, is sort of symmetrical to its QE. It did QE, it maxed out QE, then it tapered for a year. So it took uh, its its QE purchases from eighty five billion a month to zero over a period of a year. Every month, it bought less. It just wound down. So it's ramping up now in a similar fashion, but it's slightly slower pace, and just like uh, sort of the opposite of the taper. And then it will reach cruising speed of 50 billion a month, and it will maintain that. This is um, 
you got to remember when the Fed gets rid of its securities and gets cash for them, that cash just disappears. Yeah, it's just like it created money to buy these securities. It destroys money uh, when uh, when it gets rid of these securities. So this is uh, liquidity that gets sucked out of the markets. And right now, that amount is $30 billion a month, which is not huge. And the ECB is still doing QE. It has tapered. It's down to about 30 uh, billion euros a month. But it will likely taper that to zero by the end of this year. And by the end of this year, the Fed will be up to 50 billion a month in its QE and one. So now you're between the two central banks, you'll have a uh, net reduction in liquidity of about 50 billion a month. And you will, you will hear that. You will see that in the markets. I mean, this is taking a lot of liquidity off the table. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and we can already see it uh, in the bond market. Uh, you know, we can already see some issues in the stock market. Uh, short-term interest rates have risen in response to to the Fed's uh, interest rate increases. The QE unwind is taking liquidity out at the longer end of the curve. Um, so today, again, the 10-year yield is 3%. Um, you know, that's still relatively low, and it, it's uh, it's going to get pushed up by by more of those QE unwind. Um, so, yeah, QE was the wealth effect. It, were, it made uh, asset holders wealthy. That was the plan. Bernanke defined it that way publicly. Uh, the wealthy asset holders would then spend more and it would crank up the economy. Um, that, that's how it was supposed to work. Now, the QE unwind will do the opposite. Yeah, so it's, uh, it will make asset holders less wealthy. And um, yeah, it will bring asset prices down. That's what it means and that's what it will do. And, uh, and it's the Fed's plan. So... Um, <laughs> You know, people who are in denial of that, that uh, don't understand how the Fed is operating. Yeah, you know, the Fed is not, it's no longer trying to make asset holders wealthy. Yeah, you know, now it's shifted course. It's going to do the opposite. Are you bullish or bearish on the U.S. dollar? I have turned bullish on the dollar. I think in February it's the bottom out. <clears throat> and I think it will end the year higher uh, than it did in February. Um, I don't I mean, it's, it's been chumpy recently. You know, I don't know that it will maintain that kind of uh, momentum, and I doubt that it will. Uh, but uh, with what the Fed is doing on a fundamental basis, you know, it would make uh, dollar investments a lot more attractive now that yields are coming up, and uh, you know, the dollar value is set in the market uh, against other currencies. So it's Traders that are doing that, the fundamentals don't really play a big role uh, day to day. So there will be large day to day fluctuations as, as traders uh, ply the trade, and uh, and so we'll we'll see all kinds of changes. But on a fundamental, on a more long term basis, uh, you know, you will see money flowing into dollars, and that, that's coming out of the merchant markets. The merchant markets are having a huge problem right now. I mean, Argentina is uh, <laughs> is on the on the verge of collapse. It's asking for for an uh, for a bailout, um, it's uh, yeah. There, there are other emerging markets that are in trouble, um, and and emerging market investors are starting to pull the money out. And those dollars, and that's you know dollars and euros, but mostly dollars. And those dollars are going into dollar-denominated uh, assets uh, in in the United States, and uh, yeah, and and that that helps push up the dollar and makes. And this has negative consequences in the in the in the emerging market, but I'm I'm uh, I think we're on the up cycle for the dollar, and it will last quite a while. Gold and silver seem to be st- stuck in a trading range. If and when they finally break out, what kind of targets do you have for gold and silver? Well, I don't know that I uh, <laughs> that I live long enough to, um, uh, to 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 see these things. You know, I mean, uh, gold and silver uh, have cycles that can be 20 years long and uh you know you you uh, uh on the way up and on the way down so um and it can be 10 years but it, it, it's been over 20 years too in the past so we're we're about six years into the down cycle of gold um you know maybe it's finally over uh, but you know looking at history i think this could go on a lot longer Unlike oil, you know, you, when the oil price goes down far enough, uh, some oil producers go out of business and other oil producers curtail production. And so production goes down, 
consumptions or the way the amount of oil that gets burned uh, continues. And at some point, uh, yeah, the oil in storage reaches levels that is relatively low, and and then prices go back up, and or you else you you run out of oil, yeah, you know, and and then prices will soar. You don't have that in gold. Gold gets hoarded. Yeah, you know, gold is not consumed, even though we use the word for gold consumption. But the gold that's above the ground stays above the ground, and if the gold price drops, yeah, you know, uh, to ridiculously low levels. Uh, production will stop, but the gold that's above the ground won't go away. It'll stay here, you know, and, and, and we'll never run out of gold. So, uh, that's why we have cycles that are 20 years long, you know, because you, you don't run out of gold. At the same time, on the up cycle, there's no fundamental maximum beyond which gold doesn't make any more sense. Uh, it's not, it, it's used in some industrial, uh, uh, for some industrial purposes, but very small. It's not really, it's not really, uh, it doesn't really impact the gold market. And, uh, so a very high gold price doesn't change the economy of any country or anything. It, it can continue. You know, so we've had enormous up cycles and we had, uh, t- uh yeah, terrible down cycles in gold. And so, uh, I just don't have, I no longer have the patience, <laughs> you know, to, to, to outweigh these cycles. And, um, yeah, I got burned with, uh, silver right first in my, in my investing career in the early 1980s. And I did all the right things and got burned, you know, and, and it, and I got out and then silver would go down for another, you know, 15 years after I got burned. So I, it would have been nuts, uh, to, to stick with silver. And, and now silver is back where it was, you know, back then. Uh, and, and, uh, so, yeah, I have some silver now, and, and, um, and I don't expect it to go up. I just have it, and I'm gonna sit on it. And, um, and the same with gold. You know, it, it's not something that I think, uh, I would use to try to make money with. You know, it's fun to have, it's good to have. Uh, I, it could be a, a very, uh, you know, it, it can be a part in the, uh, in a portfolio. Um, while stocks and bonds and real estate and classic cars and art and everything else went up over the last you know, many years, uh, gold actually went down. So it has a sort of a counterweight to your investments. It, it's possible that when other asset prices go down together, gold may not go down with them or it may actually go up. So that, that's a reason to, to own gold because it, it, it hasn't moved over the last six years. It hasn't moved in lockstep with the other assets. With all other major assets have moved together, gold has not. So and silver. So yeah, there's there's reason, but I have no idea where this will go, and um, there's no logical number on the upside on the downside for gold. It's uh, <laughs> you know it, it's just a metal um, that I think people should enjoy having. Wolf, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. Thank you very much, Jim. We've been speaking with Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He was speaking to us from San Francisco. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Mark Faber, Wolf Richter, and thank you for listening. If you have any questions for the show or for our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Now stand by for company showcase updates from Larry Ray, the president of American Manganese, and CEO of Arctic Star, Scott Elbridge. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Thanks, Jim. It's always a pleasure to be here. In a few days, Larry, you're going to be one of the speakers at an international metals conference. What can you tell us about it? Well, it's the uh, the Vancouver conference. It's called the International Mining Investment Conference. Uh, it used to be the old Cambridge show, and uh, I'm one of the speakers there. At, uh, I'll be talking about American manganese and its uh, recycling opportunity, 
and I think this is going to be a good show. I, it's, uh, I think there's going to be a lot of investors there, and I'm hoping to uh, get a good group out when uh, during our talk. And I've invited uh, a couple of principals from Kimetco to be there to help answer questions, and I ha- I'd like to have them there just so that any skeptics in the crowd could see that there is a real company called Kometco that does all our work, and uh, they don't own any shares in my company, and they don't have any ownership in the uh, in the IPs or the patents. And uh, you know, we report what they give us, and uh, but I like to have them there. They've got experience in all the different areas. A uh, very bright group. And uh, I was hoping that that would, uh, you know, bring some of the more skeptical people out to listen to the talk. But I think it's going to be an interesting, uh, it's going to be an interesting show. We certainly have uh, several meetings already set up. And uh, it's, uh, you know, one of those typical situations where you go out to meet the world, and uh, you hope that uh, there's some investment bankers in, uh, in the group that are interested in your project and uh, will help you move it forward. Or, likewise, a company that uh, uh, would want to get involved. So I'm looking forward to the show, and uh, it's on uh, the 15th and 16th. I'll be talking on the 15th at uh, 1.30 to 2.30 in wor- workshop number one. And I invite all our shareholders and potential shareholders to come out and see that. It's an opportunity for uh, local people and people that are traveling for the show anyway to come out and uh, get a first-hand view of uh, what we're up to. So that is a, uh, it's a two-day show. We'll have a booth there, 211. So everybody has their invitation. Looking at the market, we've been uh, we've been beat up quite a bit here in the last week. Um, a lot of that's to do with the final exercise of the five cent warrants, and uh, I can say that most of that, I believe, all of that is done now. So we shouldn't be seeing any more large box box of trades come out. We had one company uh, that sold about sixty percent of the stock in the last week up till yesterday. And, uh, you know, that's unfortunate, but uh, it happens. And, uh, you know, there's no reason for anybody to be alarmed. I mean, the uh, everything's moving forward. We're still meeting with the Asian companies. And uh, as a matter of fact, we had a long meeting on, uh, on the 8th. And uh, we'll see what develops from that. I, you know, I can't, I don't make promises, but... Uh, I'm very uh, optimistic and enthused by the response that we're getting from, uh, from uh, especially from Asia. Larry, what time will you be speaking at the conference? One thirty till two o'clock. And for new listeners, Larry, can you explain what American Manganese is all about? American Manganese is a critical metal company that uh, is focused on the using its uh, intellectual properties patented process for manganese. To recycle lithium-ion batteries, we have a patent pending. I expect we'll be hearing something more about that in the next few weeks. And uh, the uh, company is traded on the uh, Toronto Stock Exchange Venture under the symbol AMY. It's traded in the U.S. under the symbol AMYZF. And it's traded in uh, Frankfurt under the symbol 2AM. And it uh, has a uh, website out there where everybody can do their due diligence. It's very, uh, it's packed full of information on our recycling. And that's at AmericanManganeseInc.com. You can reach the company uh, and myself at L-R-E-A-U-G-H at A-M-Y-M-N.com or phone us at uh, 778-574-4444. Larry, thank you so much for the update. Thanks, Jim. I've been speaking with Larry Ray. He's the CEO and president of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. We were speaking on May 11th. 
Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Scott Eldridge. He's the CEO and President of Arctic Star Exploration Corporation. Welcome to the show, Scott. Thank you very much for having me. Scott, what can you tell us about Arctic Star Exploration, and what kind of new news do you have to tell us about as well? Sure, well, we can go through those. So, first of all, just as an introduction, uh, Arctic Star is a publicly traded company. Uh, we are listed on three different stock exchanges. Uh, our primary listing is on the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture, where our ticker symbol is ADD, and we have secondary listings uh, in Frankfurt as well as the OTCQB uh, down in the United States. And within the corporation, we do have four separate projects that we can talk about. Uh, the first project is a Niobium project in, in BC uh, that we're looking to joint venture. But the real focus of the company is diamond exploration. So we do have three diamond exploration projects, uh, two of which are in Canada. Um, one is called Diagra, and the second one is called Stein. And the fourth project that we have within the company is located over in Finland, and that is also a diamond exploration project that we recently acquired uh, about six uh, months ago. And we began our first field activity there in November of uh, last year. And we do have a team of experts within the company, uh, geologists that are led by Buddy Doyle and uh, Roy Spencer, uh, most people in Canada are familiar with uh, Buddy Doyle as he was one of the major contributors to the discovery of the Divec mine uh, up in the Northwest Territories in, in Canada. And uh, just as important as Buddy is Roy Spencer. Uh, he started in the 1960s uh, with De Beers and he has a discovery to his credit as well, very similar to Buddy. Uh, Roy discovered a mine uh, over in Russia, the other side of the border of where we are in Finland, uh, call, called the Grib Mine. Uh, so both the Grib uh, and the Divic are operating diamond mines uh, that are in uh, operation uh, today owned by major mining companies. So I think today we'll focus on Finland. Um, so just to start off with, uh, any mining project, whether it's diamonds or, or copper or gold, uh, what's key to making a project uh, potentially economic uh, is the infrastructure. So in, in Finland, we are surrounded by world-class mining infrastructure that includes a nearby town, uh, highway access, uh, power to the site, uh, and an airport. Um, most diamond mines around the world uh, do not enjoy that amazing infrastructure, so that's a real benefit to this project. So what does that actually mean? If we have a discovery here, the threshold of an economic grade uh, to operate a mine is much lower than most other parts of the world, including northern Canada and Russia. So the project over in Finland, it's called uh, the Tamanti Diamond Project. Uh, as I said, we purchased that about uh, six months ago. Uh, we own the project 100%. There are no underlying royalties on it. Uh, as mentioned, we began work there in about uh, mid-November of last year. And to date, uh, our activity there has included uh, geophysics, uh, covering off magnetic, gravity, and EM surveys. Uh, excavator sampling, uh, because in this part of the world, the kimberlite bodies do come almost to the surface. So with an excavator, you can actually just scrape off the top till portion, one or two meters, and you can, um, with a backhoe, scrape into the kimberlite and, and take samples of the top of the kimberlite, which is extremely advantageous um, to get information. And then finally, we've been drilling um, over in Finland, and we've discovered two new kimberlite bodies, and the previous owner of the property had discovered uh, two kimberlite bodies as well. So we now have uh, four kimberlite bodies uh, on the project in Finland. And with this success, um, we've just recently had an opportunity to put out a news release today announcing that we've increased our land package there by 100%. 
So we're now sitting on a district scale, almost 200,000 hectare property, uh, again, that we own 100% with no underlying royalties. Um, why is that significant? Well, if you look back to the diamond staking rush uh, that occurred in the Northwest Territories uh, in Canada, there was upwards of 50 companies competing for ground uh, at the time. So with this district scale property we have, uh, if there is a discovery here, there there simply won't be a staking rush because we've already tied up the majority of the land. Um, recent news uh, as well, uh, we have put out uh, diamond results uh, on the project um, that again was taken by an excavator sample of a kimberlite body that was near surface. And we recovered a total of 245 uh, diamonds uh, out of a small sample of only about 168 kilograms. So what's really important there is the ratio of stones uh, to weight. Um, this is a world-class result. And included in those 245 stones were two uh, near-commercial-sized diamonds. Um, Keep in mind, this is only from the very top of the kimberlite body, so we've only scraped a small surface uh, portion of it. And since then, we've done much deeper drilling uh, into the kimberlite, where we now have kimberlite intercepts um, sitting in a lab waiting for caustic fusion analysis. So we do anticipate seeing those results uh, coming out um, sometime in the next uh, three weeks. And uh, we'll, we will have further news releases uh, at that time. I don't think um, I'll go into the other uh, properties that much uh, for, for this interview, but um, I will conclude just by saying that if anybody wants to find uh, further information on Arctic Star, you're welcome to search our website, which is uh, www.arcticstar.ca, or you can uh, give us a, a phone call as well. And that phone number? 604-722-5381. Scott, thanks a lot for the information. Thank you very much. I've been speaking with Scott Eldridge, CEO and President of Arctic Star Exploration, their website, arcticstar.ca. I'm Jim Goddard. We were speaking on May 10th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.